morning. Good morning. Welcome to the uh, Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Danbury. My name is Todd Zagorek. I've been coming here for 14 years, uh, although I've never gotten around to actually joining. Uh, <laughs> I've been busy. <laughs> I didn't want to rush things, did not want to rush things. But, but friends here have, uh, have gently persuaded me that it's about time. So, uh, so Tuesday night at the Pathways to Membership meeting, I will be signing the book. So. <laughs> All right. Please silence your phones. Oh, I should do that myself, uh, if you haven't already done that. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad that you're here with us this morning, uh, whether you're here in person or online, and uh, whether this is your first time with us or whether you've been here a thousand times, and whether you're a member or not a member, uh, you, are, you are welcome, and we are stronger for your presence. Uh, your presence is what makes this a special place and time for all of us. Um, as we gather here this morning, we respectfully acknowledge that this building is on the land, the traditional land of the Pogwesset people. This morning, Reverend Tony is going to conclude our month of services on the topic of interdependence by reflecting on what it means for a community like ours to be interdependent. But before we get started, uh, please Greet your neighbor, wave, say hello. Join us Sunday, May 5th at 4 p.m. right here at 24 Clappard Ridge Road in Danbury for Music at the Ridge as we present Joe Jenks. Circuit veteran Joe Jenks merges conservatory training with his Irish roots and his working class upbringing to deliver narratives filled with heart, soul, groove, and grit. Suggest a donation $20 online in advance or $25 at the door. All right, Margaret Henderson's got an announcement for us. Good morning. I hope there's a couple of people here, uh, either online or in person, who weren't here last week. Um, because if, come on in, come on in. Because if you were here last week, um, you heard a similar announcement. But um, I am currently the president of the Board of Trustees here. And this is my third year. And I um, need to do less <laughs> um, or something bad will happen. Um, so um, the, the nominating committee um, is looking for people who might be willing to be a co-president. Um, um, I realized last night as I was thinking about how creative can we get to solve this problem? Um, that one of the things that's really stressful for me that I would like help with um, from someone, which could be a, a, another board member, is um, running the monthly meetings. Um, so if you have that as a skill set, um, I would be happy to talk with you about how we could share um, some of the presidential duties. Um, the annual meeting is June 2nd, the first Sunday in June after the service. That's where we'll all vote on the incoming slate of candidates. But we need to have that slate set 
two weeks ahead of time by the bylaws, we have to inform you what you're voting on. Um, so this is the time if you're thinking that maybe, you know, I could do it except I don't have enough spaghetti. Maybe we could find someone to shop for spaghetti for you or whatever it is that's holding you back. If this is the, I, if this is the right thing for you to do, um, please think about it. I worked with a very wise person once who said, do the next thing that's yours to do. And that was a great way of saying, being able to say, no, that's not for me, but this over here is. So you're invited and encouraged to think and discuss with other people um, about whatever you might do to help the board. We're one person short. Um, so uh, let me, or nominating committee, is there anybody here today from nominating committee? Jackie Alexander, Dan Brodax, or um, Annie Chanel, yes, she's here, <laughs> yay! <laughs> Doing multiple duties as usual, coffee in the kitchen, um, but let Annie know or you can talk with me. Thank you very much. Join us today from 11.30 to 1 o'clock uh, for a, a forum on memory loss, cognitive decline, and support for caregivers with speakers from the Goldstone Caregiver Center at Danbury Hospital and the Ridgefield Visiting Nurse Association, the RVNA. Uh, this coming Tuesday, April 30th, Reverend Tony and the membership team will host a Pathways to Membership conversion conversation. Freudian. <laughs> or, no pressure for anyone interested in becoming a member. Current members are also welcome. Please RSVP to the church office to Reverend Tony or to Heather Smith. Oh, that's at 7 p.m. on Tuesday. Uh, next Sunday, May 5th, our guest speaker will be Chaplain Katie Grosh, and she will begin our month of services on the theme of pluralism by reflecting on love across enduring lines of difference. And she will share from her experiences of pluralism in practice in interfaith chaplaincy work and with the Life Worth Living Project at Yale. And then after the service next week, uh, we invite you to join the family ministry team for a Maypole celebration outside. Uh, and, and dress up, dress up for spring, dress up for the Maypole celebration, get out your pagan formal wear. Uh, <laughs> think, think flower crowns, uh, gratuitous ribbons, that sort of thing. Uh, I'm serious about the flower crowns because it would make it a more colorful, fun event for everybody. So just be ready to enjoy it. Uh, if it rains, it'll move indoors. But my phone says it's not going to rain next week, so I wouldn't worry about that. Uh, it'll be a fun celebration. Uh, our congregation has been learning about neighboring faiths, and we've had presentations at community dinners recently, and uh, we had a visit to the New Hope Baptist Church. This afternoon, from 2 to 4, we've been invited to uh, to visit the Baitul Mukarram Masjid on Main Street in Danbury. Um, it won't be a service. There won't be there won't be prayers. It will be it will be a, a tour for us. Our, our host will be Shazita Khan, and she has uh, she has spoken to neighboring faith classes here uh, before in previous years, and she will give us a tour of the uh, of the masjid, and uh, we'll talk about what it's like and what it means to live a life of Islam, in particular, what it means to live a life of Islam in this country at this time. If you are interested and need more details, uh, please uh, get a hold of Sierra Marie. For other announcements and information, you can check the order of service or the weekly email newsletter or the website has a list of, of events. So now we'll start with our chalice lighting. Uh, we make this time and place holy simply by being together and lighting our chalice as an emblem of our uh, tradition as Unitarian Universalists. So please. Join me in the uh, in the affirmation. Love is the spirit of this congregation, and justice is its light. This is our covenant to dwell together in peace, 
to seek and speak the truth in love, to help one another and celebrate life. Now please uh, rise as in a body or spirit as you are able and join us in our hymn, May Nothing Evil Cross This Door. It's number one in the gray hymnal or the words are also on the screen. Let's say together the children's affirmation. The words are going to come on your screen in just a moment. We'll wait for them. <laughs> we are Unitarian Universalists. We are people with open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. We care for the earth and each other. Today's story is inspired by, but not the same as, a Tibetan Buddhist story called Four Harmonious Friends, or Four Harmonious Brothers. Once upon a time, a bird saw a beautiful tree. She had never seen anything so wonderful in her life. She had never seen a tree so tall. It could give shelter to so many animals. So wide, it could shade any animals who came to sit beneath it, nor so full of delicious fruit for all its visitors. Bird wanted to have a tree like this closer to her home. So she took one seed from one of the delicious fruits and she flew and flew to her home on the edge of the wonderful and great forest. Bird found a small patch of dirt and she scratched with her feet and she carefully placed the seed in the hole and then she scratched some more and covered the tiny seed. But Bird began to worry about the cold winter that was coming, and she wondered what she could do to protect the small seedling from the cold. She thought of her friends, the rabbits, with their soft, warm fur, and she flew to find them. She told the rabbits of the wonderful tree, so full it could house many animals, so wide it could shade all who rested beneath, and so full of delicious fruit that it could feed any who came to visit it. She asked for the rabbits to help keep the seedling warm during the winter. The rabbits happily imagined the beautiful tree and they agreed to dig their nest close by so the warmth of their bodies would keep the soil warm for the tiny, delicate seedling. And that is exactly what they did. After the long winter, Bird flew to the spot where she had planted the wonderful seed. 
she could see the seedling, which had already became, become a small sapling, poking through the dried grass. She was worried because there were many weeds growing up beside the sapling. They would crowd the sapling and take all the ground's moisture. They would take the nutrients from the soil that help plants grow strong. Pulling weeds is a lot of work, and some of them already had strong roots that clung to the earth as Bird tried to pull them out with her beak. This was not a job for one animal alone. She needed help to get rid of the weeds, and so she went to find Monkey. Bird told Monkey all about the wonderful tree. Monkey could see in their mind's eye a place for them and their family and friends to swing and play and nap. They could almost taste the delicious fruit that Bird described, and they were willing to help. So Monkey carefully pulled all the weeds from the sapling. Monkey and Bird came every week to pull weeds together so the sapling would have all the air, space, and nutrients that it needed to grow. But that year was a particularly dry year. It didn't rain much. Many of the plants were getting weak from lack of water. Most had long roots that went deep into the ground where there was some moisture. But the delicate little tree sapling only had tiny roots and its leaves began to droop because it needed water so badly. When Bird flew to check on the sapling, she saw that it was in danger in the drought. How could Bird get water to the plant? She could go to the river and take a mouthful of water, but a few drops wouldn't be enough to help the sapling. Who could help? Then she thought of her friend, the elephant. Of course, elephant could carry in one trunk enough water to soak the ground around the sapling for the whole week. Bird flew to find elephant, hooray! And when she had described the wonderful shade, the strong bark that animals could rub their backs on and the delicious fruit, the elephant couldn't wait to get to the river to fetch water for the thirsty sapling. And so it was that the sapling was cared for by the friends as it grew into a tree. It became strong, wide, beautiful, and tall. But how, with a tree so tall, could it share its fruits with anyone? What about the animals who weren't climbers? It could share the fruits because bird would fly to the top and gather the fruits up high. Monkey would jump on elephant's back, climb into the tree, and shake its branches. And all the rabbits would run and gather the fruit that fell. And that is how, at the edge of the forest, there came to be a tree for everyone. So ends the story. Thank you, actors. All right, I'm going to invite Maisie to the front to light our lantern with our chalice light so we can bring it downstairs with us and I'm going to ask all the other kids to pause and not go downstairs until we follow Maisie with the light and the rest of us will all sing together this little light of mine. every Sunday is, is a time of centering community. <clears throat> and our congregation, like all congregations, are held up at the core by a backbone of dedicated members who are in it for the long haul. It's a reflection by Rudy Nemser called Long Haul People. You find them in churches when you're lucky. Other places too though mostly I only know the ecclesiastical version, long haul people, a 
upon whose shoulders and pocketbooks and wallets and casseroles and daylight, nighttime, all time hours, a church is built and maintained after the brass is tarnished and the cushions need restitching. They pay their pledges full and on time, even when the music's not to their liking. They support each canvas, even though the sermons aren't necessarily short. <laughs> they mow lawns and come to suppers and satyrs. They teach Sunday school when there's no one else to do it, and they'll miss the service. Ask what they think of the minister or plans for the kitchen renovation or the choral selection or the Christmas pageant or the color of the bathroom paint or what to do with the foyer and entrance. They reply, oh, individuals and fashions arrive and pass. The church, their church, their congregation will be here steady and hail for a long, long time. It will. For long haul people bless it with a special blessing. And long haul people are the ones we rely on to do the things that make us thrive. And we hope that all of us become those long haul people together. And each Sunday, we gather as a community during this time to share what is in our hearts. It reminds us we're all in this together, this sometimes painful and sometimes wondrous human journey through this life. It's a good time to remember people who are hurting or need our support. Together, we create a heart space in the here and now for seeking and granting forgiveness, a place where people may put and share grief, a time to offer hope and healing, and a time to share and joy with each other and to give thanks and offer gratitude for whatever blessings great and small are in our lives. In order to create the space with each other and for each other, we refrain from announcements and political opinion. We include everybody. And if you're with us online, please know that you can share your milestones in the chat and, and Todd will come share them with us. So I invite you to enter into a time of reflection and I invite those who would like to share silently by placing a stone in the water to represent their milestone to come forward and do so. That have been shared, let's enter a moment of silence together. continued affirmation of the milestones. Let's join in singing Spirit of Life. Our reading today is an excerpt from a different church by Gail R. 
Geisenheiner. I was forthrightly evangelized into Unitarian Universalism. I was 38 years old, living in Maine, driving a snowplow for a living, and feeling very sorry for myself when a friend invited me to his church. All churches are the same, I informed him. They say they're open, but they don't want queer folk. To heck with church. My friend persisted. He assured me I could come and not have to hide any aspects of myself. So I went. And I dressed so carefully for my first Sunday visit. I carefully arranged my outfit so it would highlight the rock hard chip I carried on my shoulder. <laughs> I bundled up every shred of pain and hurt and betrayal I'd harbored from every other religious experience in my life. And I lumbered into that tiny meeting house on the coast of Maine. They could accept me in my full Amazon glory or they could fry ice. <laughs> I expected the gray-haired ladies in the foyer to step back in fear. That would have been familiar. Instead, they stepped forward, offered me a bulletin and a newsletter, and invited me to stay for coffee. It was so odd. They never even flinched, and they called me dear. <laughs> stay for coffee, dear. This was the mid-1980s. On my second or third Sunday, a woman stood during joys and concerns to announce that all homosexuals were deviants who should be packed off to work camps and keep their filthy lifestyle and deadly diseases to themselves. I was at a crossroads. Would I go back? Why on earth would I go back? That would be, well, you fill in the word, dangerous, stupid, foolhardy, looking for trouble, probably hurtful. But back I went. I was in the throes of learning my first lessons of being in covenant with a congregation. When we covenant to walk together through all that life brings, it means that when things get ugly, we don't walk away. Oh, how we may want to walk away, but our covenants call us to abide and work things through. The congregation had passed a test. One, one among them had tried to create a class of less than human persons toward whom violence would be acceptable. The congregation gently refused to follow. But an even more extraordinary and wonderful thing happened. The congregation also refused to depersonalize or dehumanize the original speaker. While the speaker tried to turn homosexuals into objects to be manipulated, the congregation never referred to her in a way that was less than embracing and respectful of her full humanity. I stayed for coffee. I stayed for Unitarian Universalism. Over time, the good folks of that church loved up the scattered parts of me and guided me from shattered to whole, from outcast to beloved among many. That's the reading. It's time for our offering. Uh, when we give of our time and our energy to each other and we make financial contributions, we're giving gifts to each other. We all give and we all receive. Uh, and together we give to the community around us. So this morning, to make your gift, uh, you can use the link or the QR code, whether you're online or the, the, the QR code and the link are online or they are also uh, in the chat. Or you can send a check to 24 uh, Clapboard Ridge Road in Danbury. And thank you for your generosity.
see a lot of people here this morning who are here Friday night for our Seder. Who is here for the Seder? Yeah, a lot of people. The room was really full. There was a table that went all the way down the length of the room. And when some people came a little later, we had to set up another table over there off the side. There were a lot of children present. That was really wonderful. It was an amazing intergenerational experience, like being part of a huge extended family. The thing, in a way, you can't find anywhere else but a congregation. Some people who are here on Friday, members of the congregation, some were not. We had a bunch of guests. It was really an amazing evening. And all of us together, we were fulfilling, actually, the purpose of our congregation. Providing an open, caring community, welcoming people of diverse backgrounds who come seeking spiritual, personal, and intellectual growth. Creating a place where adults and children are taught, nurtured, love, and given freedom to explore and define individual beliefs while we affirm and promote Unitarian Universalist values of peace, social justice, and religious tolerance for all people. Well, who is it, the Seder again? Who is it? Now, while you were here Friday night, did you think you were doing all of that? Yes. Yes, okay. Some people actually did. Yay. Yeah. Sometimes we don't even think of it when we're doing what we're here to do because it's what, because it's what we do. <laughs> And that was the most wonderful thing of all to me. You know, what's it mean to create a place where people of all ages can learn and be nurtured and loved and given freedom and explore their individuality and be part of a community? What's that mean? Well, I think what that means is kind of what it means to be a member of a congregation. So, What's it mean to be a member of the congregation to you? Not a rhetorical question. Go ahead, think about it for a second. What's it mean to be a member of this congregation to you? Not what it means in our bylaws. <clears throat> Not what it's supposed to mean. What's it mean to you? It's important because how we define this defines our relationship to this place and to each other and really has an impact on how interdependent we are and might become. Take a minute, I'm gonna watch, take a minute and share with each other what you were thinking about what it means to be a member here, go ahead. It never ceases to amaze me that when I ask people in a Unitarian Universalist congregation to talk to each other for a minute, I could pretty much just go have my coffee now. <laughs> but that's awesome because most of you turned right away to somebody else and started sharing. Again, an exact lived reality of what we say we're about. It's kind of amazing. 
did any of you actually talk about being in agreement with the purposes of the congregation, signing the membership book and making and fulfilling a financial commitment of record? <laughs> if anyone talked about that, raise your hand. <laughs> And, and I don't do this just as a joke. Think about that. Because what I just read is what's in our bylaws of what makes someone a member. <laughs> and I'm going to bet, you know, I couldn't hear everybody's conversation individually, but I would almost really put money on this, that you all talked about relationship and meaning and <laughs> values and not about a financial commitment or signing your name in a book. You know, because according, you know, the bylaw thing, you know, our congregation and really most UU congregations, we don't really ask too much of people. I'm going to ask you to hold that because I'm not so sure that's a good thing. I don't know. But there's a lot of things to think about with that. Because what if we asked of everybody what you all talked about? Can we? Do we? How? A story to start some reflection. I went on a fascinating field trip in 2011 to this huge conference at a very big mega church outside Dayton, Ohio, the Gingamsburg Church in Tip City, Ohio. My sister lives in Dayton, Ohio. I had never heard of this church. It's like 12 miles from our house. But I probably should have, given what I learned there. There was a group of five Unitarian Universalist ministers from Texas, where I was at the time, and we were all into missional congregations. How does our congregation serve the world? How do we get out there? And this conference was said to be the best of its kind. It was called Save the World, and they did it at that time every October. I think they do it in April now. So we called them up and asked, can five Unitarian Universalist clergy from Texas get your congregational group discount for registering. <laughs> the person said they'd get back to us. Eventually, they did let us. They were so interested that Unitarian Universalists wanted to come to this. They're like, sure, give them the discount, let them come. And we actually got to meet with a pastor and everything. It was really interesting. So we got there, and we discovered that Ginghamsburg, being a Methodist congregation, it's a fairly middle-of-the-road Christian congregation in many ways. They weren't hyper-progressive, but they certainly were not fundamentalist and hateful and excluding. You know, kind of your middle-of-the-road Methodism that, I don't know, maybe some of you might have even grown up in. And I learned a lot that weekend. But one of the long-lasting lessons I took away was what does it mean to be a member of a congregation? What do we ask of each other? Ginghamsburg was a floundering little country church of about 100 people outside Dayton, Ohio in 1979 when a new pastor named Mike Slaughter arrived. And he decided to grow the congregation by focusing on a mission to serve the world around them. 31 years later, when I attended that conference, Pastor Slaughter was starting to get ready for retirement. But Ginghamsburg then had a 75-acre campus and averaged over 4,500 people worshiping at their various services every weekend. Uh-huh. And the reason for this growth wasn't, in a very real sense, their focus on mission. Mission, if you look on their website, still there, to serve the poor and disenfranchised in their neighborhood and in the world. And they were good at it. Slaughter and his church became known as early innovators and early adopters of small group ministry, the church media reformation, and cyber ministry. When I visited, and this was back in 2011, they had, over the last handful of years, invested over $4 million in sustainable humanitarian efforts in Darfur. They had sent over 50 teams of volunteers to New Orleans to help with post-Katrina rebuilding efforts. They operated not one, not two, but three independent 501c3 nonprofit organizations. One was focused on outreach to the community and general service. One was a counseling center that provided 
actual therapy to anybody regardless of ability to pay. And the other was the Dream Builders Clubhouse, an after school center that did a number of different things. And these organizations served over 50,000 people in the area every year. The congregation at that time had received awards for outstanding community service from George W. Bush and Bill Clinton. U.S. News and World Report named it one of the 50 best churches in America and Mike Slaughter one of the 50 best Christian leaders in America. And I would learn while I was there that weekend that part of what made all that possible was how they thought about membership strangely enough, and how membership was connected to their mission. Even though their average Sunday attendance, weekend attendance was around 5,000, they only had about 500 members. <laughs> and one reason for this was that the requirement levels of being a member were extraordinary. Their membership process required a multi-session, multi-week class. I looked on their website this week. The next one is six Sundays from May 19th to June 30th, 9 to 10 a.m. before service. Membership requires a stewardship pledge of at least 10% of your net income. You must agree to be a member of JOIN and regularly attend a small group ministry. And they have dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens. Some of them at the time I was there had been meeting for 25 years. And you must sit for an extensive interview with a member of the pastoral staff about how you would be of service, not to the congregation, to the world around you. You needed a plan of how you would put your faith into action in your life. It was part of what the class was for to help you think about all of this stuff. But still, can you imagine a Unitarian Universalist congregation even hinting at this level of membership requirement? No, no, but it worked for them. It produced a thriving and effective congregation of thousands of people. Their models fascinated me for years because I couldn't really piece together what all the details were working together that really did make it work. Yes, they had a mission that was very outward focused. Great. But there are a lot of congregations that have outward focused missions and they're dysfunctional and tiny and fall apart. And there's congregations that are big and thriving and don't serve the world hardly at all. So that alone can't be it. And the more and more I thought about it as the years went by, I think it was due to their membership process. And not because of the intense requirement level. I don't think that in itself is, is what did it. I think the model worked because it clearly defined the mission of the congregation. And it defined very clearly what commitment to the model looked like. And if that was for you, great. And if it wasn't, great. You can still come here and do everything. We don't mind. Awesome. You're welcome. Their model, consciously and intentionally, although they might not have called it this, developed long haul people. There's a guy named Matthew Ferris who writes a blog I like called Gentleman Theologian. And a couple of years ago, he wrote a thing on membership and commitment. He says, I've been a member of a church that had no formal membership requirements whatsoever. One was not required to sign on to any covenant. But if you missed a Sunday, you would get a call that afternoon from one of the church elders saying, hey, we missed you this morning. You okay? How you doing? Not why weren't you at church? Are you okay? What are you doing? We missed you. That was from a Christian church. And it wasn't, you're going to go to hell. You missed church this morning. It was, we missed you. Are you okay? That's it. He explains that a formal type of membership isn't even necessary for a congregation to function or be successful or for leaders to successfully lead it in its mission. 
He says, in many churches where a formal membership process exists, it represents an enigma. And I agree. Think about this. Sometimes congregations, ours, others, have non-members who do very member-like things all the time as a regular basis. Todd did them for 11 years, 14 years. What was it? 14 years. And that's not to pick on Todd or make a joke. It's just That's just a lived reality. That's not special, right? This happens all the time, actually. And congregations also have members that never seem to give any money, never show up, and never get involved in anything. The membership is an enigma. It's like, what are we really talking about? Is it membership or is it commitment to the community? Because it's commitment to the mission and the community that holds the group together. Not whatever membership things you have in your bylaws or if you have an eight week class that everyone has to attend to, or you, know, you hold them up at gunpoint for 10% of their income or whatever it is, right? But the focus of commitment gets people going. And it makes me think that that's what my experience at Ginghamsburg actually showed me. It wasn't high membership requirements. It wasn't intense mission of service. It was that everyone had the same idea of commitment if you were a member. And even some of their non-members had a high level of commitment. They just weren't members. So much so, that level of commitment was so much that nothing could phase them or turn them away from their faith and involvement in the community, like the long haul people. I think that Ginghamsburg is successful because they clearly identified who they are, what they're about in their mission and what it specifically looked like to be committed to that mission and each other. Developing our commitment to each other and to the congregation is really talking about our interdependence. And interdependence requires trust. And trust requires healthy relationships. And healthy relationships require communication. Interdependence hinges on dependence. To be interdependent means that sometimes you are going to be dependent upon and sometimes people will depend on you. And the reality with human beings is that the great majority of us are far better at being dependent upon than we are at admitting our need for others and needing to depend on them. We develop trust in relationship and we develop close relationships by spending time together, conversing, talking, listening, having fun together, being here on Sunday morning together, satering together. Our newest members and our oldest, our oldest and our youngest, together. The more time we spend all together, builds our healthy interdependent relationship. Any relationship where the participants are not spending quality time together drift apart. And that's true whether you're a member of a congregation or with your friends, where's the, the friends who are still getting together or your life partner. You'll drift apart if you're not spending that time connecting. And committee meetings are not connecting. Interdependence requires a mutuality. And that mutuality and relationship requires communication. Exchanging with each other, not just what we think and our opinions on stuff, but the reality of what's going on with us, how we feel. Why do we ask people when we gather in teams or groups or committees to light a chalice and do a check-in? That's not just so we can light a chalice because we're UUs. There's a much deeper reason for doing this. It's because when we do check-in, 
we're listening to each other and conversing relationally. If the whole conversation, the entire conversation, the bulk of conversation we have with each other is business and decision-making, then our relationships with each other become purely transactional. Accomplishing business, making a decision, moving on. If we make time to work on and share our feelings and our experiences as well as our thoughts, what's going on in our lives with each other, we deepen the connection, the relationship, the trust, and the bonds of interdependence can really get tight because we're allowing ourselves to be vulnerable, making space for vulnerability in the other, really forging that kind of connectedness that lets us all be in this together for the long haul. To show up, not just for coffee, but for Unitarian Universalism and each other. And how we're doing this relating to each other can be greatly influenced by how we think about what our congregation is. What is this community that we're relating to each other within and for and around? There are many different ways to think about what a congregation is, but it really does impact whether we're thinking about it consciously or not, how we're thinking about our relationships to each other, not just as members, but as people who are committed to each other and the idea of why we're here. A colleague of mine, David Pyle, put together a little list of the different ways congregations conceptually you know, think of themselves. And some of the things he lists are congregation as fire department, where the congregation provides a needed service in the community and the members commit to serving that need in the community together. Another is congregation as seminary, where the congregation is a training school for ministry and members are training for ministry in formation and how to live their faith in the world and in the community. Congregation is community organizing center. Congregation is the center for social justice organizing focused on one or more issues and members are activists that coordinate their work with each other through the community. The congregation is community center. The congregation is the center for a community of members and friends and neighbors and the building becomes the actual community center where the community events and programs happen. Congregation as social club. The congregation is a gather of dues paying members who organize club activities, sometimes help with events and leaving all the heavy lifting to the club elected officers. And all these models are just conceptual and a congregation can certainly function in more than one of these ways at the same time but most congregations really center on one more than the others. And I think there's some others I've encountered over my time in ministry. One is congregation as convenience store. It's in the neighborhood and members from the community go get their various goods and services to meet their needs. And when the congregation is no longer meeting those needs or offering what they want, they just shop somewhere else. Congregation as temple or mystical communion. The congregation is a center of religious practice and members come for the ritual or prayers or meditation and carry on the other parts of their lives in other places. You could probably think of more models, but how we think of the community impacts how we relate to the community and each other. Some models require a deep sense of interdependence and interconnectedness and mutual relationship, others less so. We don't have a creed in Unitarian Universalism, but we keep covenant. And our covenant is the promises about how we'll be in relationship to each other. But all too often in many congregations, even when we put our covenant into lots of wordsmithed promises and long statements, we don't necessarily what it, agree on what it means to live that out. What you all talked about when I asked you earlier about what it means to be here, 
That's your covenant. That's what you're promising to each other. And in the end, it's, it's much more simple, I think, than a lot of us want to conceive of it as in Unitarian Universalism. Gail Geisenheiner, that, that reading, by the way, is from a sermon that was 20 minutes long. She gave at General Assembly, which go watch it on the internet. It's amazing. But what she talks about is that when it got down to the relationality of those promises, it was through the good and the bad, through helping each other, no matter what occurred in the relationship, to promise to stick it out, work it out, find a way to get back, to be that example of love we say we are. That's something a congregation can do that I challenge you to find any other organization in our society that does it. That's where we live. And I wonder sometimes if there's things we can do to increase the sense of relatedness and interdependence we have with each other. We have Danbury in our name, but not everyone in this room lives in Danbury. Some of us don't even live in Connecticut. And if we're going to be in close relationship and contact to each other, maybe one of the things we can do is plot where all of us live on a map and then contact all the little dots or pins that are closest to each other and encourage them and give them resources for getting together with each other closer to where you live on a regular basis for meals, for fun, to go serve your community locally out where you are. One congregation I formerly served called this their neighborhoods program because they drew from a big, big way around. We have grown in our religious education program here in the last year. And maybe one of the ways we can reimagine our connection is finding ways to make it easier for parents and families to connect, find out how we can provide more of what they need encourage them to have relationship with each other beyond just being here on Sunday morning, finding ways that intergenerationally we can benefit from each other no matter what our age is chronologically. And I think again of our Seder on Friday night. There was a crowd, a group, a gaggle, eight, 10 children, ran off finding the Afikoman all over the place and they all got prizes. It was great. This is what builds us together so that when we do finally hit a committee meeting, we are in such relationship with each other that it's easier for us to focus on where we're going, what decisions we need to make, what business we need to do. I once had a, a board that took a class called Serving with Grace. And when they were done, they found they would spend a half hour, 45 minutes of their board meeting checking in. And then they were able to get more done in that remaining hour than they had been in their two hour meetings anyway. Because all the needs to be heard, all the needs to have your ideas out there, all the other things that we want relationally that aren't happening while we're doing business have happened. And, and we're there in connection with people already. And then we move more quickly because we're not trying to do the relating and figuring out and if it's safe to speak and all that kind of stuff at the same time. So what's it mean to be committed to each other and to the congregation? What's it mean to be a member? Maybe we can continue to have conversations about these things. Because how we answer all these questions I've asked us to think about this morning really does determine where we're going next and how we're gonna get there and with who. What's it mean to us to create a place where people of all ages are taught, nurtured, loved, and given freedom to explore and define who they are and what they believe? What's it mean?
Our hymn of celebration is Come Sing a Song With Me. It's number 346. If you have the hymnal and we have the slides. I invite you to rise and body your spirit and sing with us. Please join me in the words for extinguishing our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts and out into the world until we are together again. Before the post food, I have to make an announcement. I have to take you on an imaginary journey with your folding beach chair to the street or little New England community where you are going to go to the parade on Memorial Day or Labor Day. And you're gonna see the kids from the nursery school in their wagons, and you're gonna see the high school band, and you're gonna see organizations from, from uh, the town, and you're going to see the visiting firemen on parade, okay?
Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Barbara. And uh, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for joining us online. And that concludes our service.